Welcome to today's webinar, Interoperability and Population Health. Before we begin, let's go over a few housekeeping items. If you're on the line and you've not yet connected to the webinar, click a link in your confirmation email. Your browser may prompt you to download and run a file. When you're connected, you should see the presentation on your screen. If you have questions, you can send them via WebEx's chat function. Please take a moment and find the chat bubble icon in the upper right corner. You can type and send questions throughout the presentation. We'll compile them and take time at the end for answers. This webinar is being recorded and a copy will be made available to all attendees after the event. Now it's time to begin. Dr. Matthew Hoffman is the Chief Medical Informatics Officer, or CMIO, at the Utah Health Information Network, UHIN. Based in Salt Lake City, UHIN operates the CHI, Utah State Designated Health Information Exchange. Matt earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Finance from Brigham Young University. Afterward, he worked as a research coordinator for the Utah Psoriasis Initiative, where he co-authored multiple papers published in the National Dermatology Journals. He earned his medical doctorate from the University of Utah in 2010, and while earning his MD, Matt also pursued his, pursued his master's degree in biomedical informatics at the University of Utah. Following his graduation from medical school, Matt completed a fellowship in pharmaceutical informatics with Roche in San Francisco, California. At UHIN, Matt has architected and overseen the implementation of CareAchieve, UHIN's data analytics tool. He has also presented nationally on Health Information Exchange at the Health Information Management System Society, HIMSS, annual conference, and the eHealth Initiative annual conference. And with that, I turn the time over to Matt. There we go. Can everyone hear me okay? Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate that. I just got the thumbs up. Uh, so today we're going to talk about interoperability and population health and give a little bit of overview of uh, who you hint. Now you can hear me okay. There we go. Sorry. Apparently spacebar mutes me. Uh, so we're going to talk, give an introduction of uh, who UHIN is, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the value that's added by having an HIE for both providers, payers, and public health, uh, and then talk about po improved population health and how interoperability can help with that, and then how we're doing uh, some of the use cases that we're doing in Utah around risk assessment and improving risk assessment accuracy, and then we'll do some specific use cases that we're doing and some of the dashboards and analytics that we've developed here at UHIN. There we go. So uh, this is actually our 2018 is actually UHIN's 25th anniversary. We were founded in 1993, where we were convened by the community to form a nonprofit to begin to exchange uh, claims information electronically and to move away from those paper systems. Uh, since then, we've grown steadily, and in the last few years, uh, we've also formed a clearinghouse, which gives us the ability to begin to do reports and analysis on that claims information as it moves through the system and also appointed to do a health information exchange and become the state designated HIE. So we have three different lines of business here at UHIN. Uh, we have the clearinghouse, as I mentioned, which is the, involves the exchange of claims and then also the ability to develop reports and do some analyses on those claims as they pass through the system just to help with the flow of information and also help those uh, both sending and receiving claims to better process that and make the system more efficient and then also help them to begin to analyze and help with patient care. Uh, we've also formed the Clinical Health Information Exchange, or the CHI, uh, which has begun back in uh, 2010, 2011, and is progressively moving forward with the exchange of that information. Uh, and then just recently, in the last year and a half, we've created a data analytics and business intelligence layer, which takes information from both the claims and the clinical side and puts that in together in a way that we can begin to do more complex analyses and begin to really get at the root of what's leading to some of the cost of healthcare and how we can improve care of the patients. So today, uh, we are still a nonprofit clearinghouse. Uh, we exchange you know, more than 3 million claims and remittances monthly, eligibility requests, uh, and uh, also remittance advices. Uh, so we have a significant amount of traffic through our system. 
and then we're considered one of the gold standards for health information exchange. So we have 5 million lives in our master patient index. I believe it's five, almost 5.5 million now uh, from Utah, from the neighboring states, but then also from around the entire world. So we have a big chunk from um, Western Europe, people who've come here from uh, those countries, and then also from parts of Asia for the national parks, for mountain biking, for skiing. And they injure themselves, are seen at a hospital, and we capture their information. Uh, so we also have 53 million uh, clinical records that are associated with those patients in the Qi. And that includes transcriptions, radiology, uh, admission notes, discharge summaries, progress reports. Um, and then, as we've expanded our relationship with those other states in the West, we've also become the Western hub to connect those states for both exchange of identity, identity information and also to uh, do alerts for admissions to hospitals and discharges from hospitals across state borders also. And we'll get more in depth about that specific use case in a few minutes. So for the clearinghouse, uh, we have a couple of different product lines. Uh, one is the concierge service, which is around electronic eligibility and to help uh, both payers and providers to use the, to help push their claims through the system as quickly as possible and to deal with any issues that may arise uh, to both submit claims and then check on the status of those claims as they go through the system. Um, and then we have multiple uh, new lines coming down, the Pike 4, uh, the clearinghouse side, including electronic attachments, uh, either through uh, HL7 and, and also X12 as those standards are developed. And then we're continually working to develop better analytics and reporting tools from those that claims information. So clearing the clearinghouse, um, we process, as I mentioned before, process millions of transactions every day, including 835s, 999s, 275s. You can see the list there. Uh, and if, there, if you have any questions about those, please uh, give us a shout. We're happy to help or to answer any questions. And for the clinical health information exchange, um, we help providers and we help payers to see the entire story of what's going on with the patient. As patient moves between system, we have the ability to bring that information together and then attach it to that patient so that you can see a comprehensive view of what's happening with that patient. As part of all of that data, we have a handful of tools that we use to increase the access and use of that data. So we have uh, what are called ADT alert notifications um, through our ENS system, electronic notification system. And those ADTs, in essence, are admissions, discharge, and transfer notifications that we receive from all the different hospitals. Currently, we're connected to over 90% of the hospitals in the state, and by the end of the year, we're shooting to have 100% of the hospitals connected. Um, as part of that, we also have tools for direct messaging. We have the ability to do connections for public health reporting. And as this data comes in from these multiple data sources, we then put it, run it through a data normalization and standardization process, which makes it much more useful. So if one hospital calls a complete or a CBC of a complete blood cell count, uh, another hospital can call that a CBC. We normalize that so that the lab test name is the same no matter where it's sent from so that those viewing and using and consuming that information is an easy process for them. Uh, those hospitals, as, as I mentioned, we have IHCA, IASIS, and Amount to University of Utah, and then many of the smaller rural hospitals are connected also. And then through our ADT alert, through that notification service, we've reached out and we're part of a project, it's actually a nationwide project called the Patient Centered Data Home. Many people have heard of the patient-centered medical home. We tried to play off of that to do with the patient-centered data home. In essence, what that does is as a patient from another state is visiting Utah and they're seen here and we receive a notification that they were seen at the hospital, we will look for that state of their home address, take that information, and push it to that state to see so that they can inform the physician at that state that the patient was seen at a hospital in Utah. And that happens bidirectionally. And we're working on expanding that so that inf so that actual clinical information can be shared across those state borders for the patients to their state of home residence, which really helps out the physicians who are caring for these patients to track what's going on with the care of their patient no matter where they go.
So as the state designated HAE, as I mentioned, we've got over 5 million unique lives in the MPI with 500 plus data sources for, the, for our state, and including 53 million records. And then we are the Western Hub, so those are the states that we currently have connected, and we're working on expanding that to Washington, Oregon, and Montana. We actually do have part of California currently connected, the southern part of California, and we're working on growing that network. And then as the hub, we will reach out to other hubs across the country and connect to those so that information can be shared nationally, specifically right now around alerts, but we'll be expanding that to be around all clinical information. And for our data analytics and, and business intelligence tools, so this is a new solution that we're bringing up. We've been working on it for a few years, but we feel like we've hit that threshold where now it's becoming a viable tool and something that can be very useful. And so you can have the opportunity to visualize data in real time as it's coming through the system. Uh, we have the ability to create some of the ca uh, custom dashboards. And what's most important is we really focus on having actionable information, actionable data. So you can go and look at a dashboard and it's not as much, wow, that's interesting. It's more of, I can create this list and I can reach out to these patients and I can begin to work with them to improve their care and to um, help them to see the physicians that they need to see and get the care that they need and make sure they have the follow-up that they need. And as part of these dashboards, we have heat maps, we have geomapping um, and tables that are underlying this so you can see patient information. And what's really nice is that we have the ability to reach out to multiple databases and to build those connections, mix it with the data that we have in our system with the data from the proprietary um, database and create a dashboard that's customizable. So we found that it's very useful. And we'll show some examples of these dashboards at the end of the presentation. So for those of us who'd like to geek out on IT, I'll, we'll go over the architecture. And if you have any questions, please just shoot them in there, raise your hand and, and we'll get to those. But this is the, outlaw, the uh, layout of our um, system. And uh, you can see that we have an interface engine here where we begin to build these connections between the labs, the providers, and the hospitals, and to bring that information in. And we've actually built connections with payers also, where payers are submitting medication history for their members so that we can bring that information and consume it and combine it with the claims, inf uh, sorry, with the clinical information. We do that through an interface engine where we go out and build connections to these data sources. And then that runs through the RMPI engine where we assign those that data to the correct person and we resolve identities so that Matt Hoffman, who's seen up in Logan, can match up with Matthew Hoffman, who's seen in St. George, and it, that data gets associated with the right individual. Um, and then as that passes through, when we resolve those identity issues, then, we, then that's where we do the standardization layer and the normalization layer of that data. That information goes into a central data repository where that information can be um, began to be analyzed and we begin to look through patterns for that. And we'll get a little bit more detail as that information passes through the data warehouse of the process that we do for that ETL process. Um, but then we also have the ability to pull information from our central data repository and then through a query to pull information from other central data repositories like Intermountain or the VA, for example where that information can be queried and combined in a single patient view of, of their complete comprehensive record. And that's done through our clinical portal or what typically people think of when they say the CHI. That is our clinical portal that provides a patient-by-patient -patient lookup of that entire record of the patient. So as that information passes through the repository, it goes through our MPI, and then what we do is we begin to what we do an ETL process, uh, an extraction, transform, and load process. And through that, we do indexing of the data, where in many instances we receive a big chunk of text that we get from a doctor's clinical visit as he's uh, interviewing the patient. He'll go in and he'll write typically a SOAP note, so a subjective objective assessment and plan note that includes you know, the history of the present illness and then family history, general patient history, and then a physical exam, labs, diagnoses, and then what the plan is to move forward. And so we use the natural language processing engine to go in and to begin to pull out data from those notes that the physician has put in. 
And then we extract that data and we begin to look for problem lists. We begin to look for specific procedures that were done. We look for allergies and then medications that the physician has subscribed. And we take that information out and we put it in a structured engine where we can begin to do analyses on that and we can begin to create dashboards and we can begin to do data pushes and create reports. And so we find that it's very valuable for the community to get access to this data that previously was inaccessible and then begin to analyze and look for those patterns that can help these patients get better. We do that through a Python engine instead of a SQL engine um, which is just a computer programming language that we use to generate some of these queries and begin to look at this information. So our goal is to capture this data, put it in a single place to go to to look for, clean it up, normalize it, and in so doing, add value. We want to add value for the providers, we want to add value for the payers, and for hospitals, for public health, we found a great partnership with the Utah Department of Health as we work together to pull this information together and begin to look for different patterns in the community. And then others as we continue to reach out to long-term care facilities, to home health, to EMS, and expand the use of this data and begin to add true value for them. So for the the providers, we've found that we can pull this information together and provide a comprehensive view of the patient record. This is super helpful for really two big groups of patients. Those patients who come in and the physician has never seen before, they can go in and look at that record and look at everything that's happened before and then um, compare that with the visit with the patient and pull that all together to get a true diagnosis of what's going on with the patient. It's also beneficial for those patients who are either have multiple chronic diseases, who are seeing multiple specialists, or those patients who have complicated cases where there maybe something is missing and be able to look at all these records and look for those patterns and look for something that might have been missed is super helpful also in diagnosing that patient appropriately. This also adds for follow-up on referrals, that a primary care physician can send the doc their patient off to see a doctor who's a specialist and then never hear back. But through the Health Information Exchange, they can get those records, look at the results of that visit, and then reach out to the patient for a follow-up to, to see if any medications need to be changed or if their own plan that they have for that patient needs to be changed or augmented. Um, it also allows to do measure outcomes improvement. So if you're tracking your hemoglobin A1Cs for your patients and you're trying to get those quality metrics the way that you want them to be, but you might have missed a hemoglobin A1C somewhere, you can see that in that system and bring it over into your own, which really helps for those, uh, for those measure outcomes and to fill those gaps of care. But the big benefit where interoperability really hits, especially the pocketbook, and that is, is to decrease repeat exams and labs. We hear stories over and over again of how a patient was seen last week, they had a whole lab work done, they had some x-rays done, and they go to a new doctor via a referral even, and now that information isn't there and the new doctor wants to go get those numbers all over again because they need to know what's going on. It's totally legitimate use. But if we can share that information and present it to the, the receiving physician, then that really saves a whole bunch of money on having to rerun all these exams and redo all these studies film-wise. Uh, it truly is where the cost was going to be felt in the system as a whole. And some of the payers' ads for uh, some of the value add for the payers follow along those same path lines that it really helps them in saving on those repeat costs. But it gives them access to data. Primarily, the payers have been limited to only accessing claims information, which sometimes isn't complete and many times is, is months late. And so it gives them access to this clinical data in a way that's easy to use, can be put directly into their systems, and they don't have to send people out to sit down at computers within doctor's practices to find that data. That includes lab transcriptions, radiology, and then obviously the admissions and discharges that we've mentioned a few times. And the real goal of this is to improve those, those outcome measures because then we know that the patients are getting better care. But then it helps them in their star ratings to say, yes, we take the care of our patients very seriously and we work aggressively to make sure that they get the care that they need. 
Uh, and so it truly, with this added information, it helps them track the progress of the patient. Instead of going from yes, no on they received the lab test, they could actually see what the lab results were and they can track the progress of that patient. And also in exchanging this information, it helps with better case management. And we're really working this year to expand that and to increase the use of these care plans and share these care plans through uh, the HIE and through the exchanges that we've already built. Hospitals also receive better value because they can get better data. They can get single feeds where that information is maintained and shared and through a single feed. Um, it also improves their follow-up and decreases readmissions because the, the physicians who care for these patients in the community are being notified that the patient has been admitted, has been then discharged from the hospital, and needs to be seen in the office. This greatly um, decreases the number of readmissions that are happening because the patient is getting the care that they need. And it also helps them to communicate with the community and share this information without having to go out and specifically meet with every single doc and, and hand off this information one by one. It happens through the HIE automatically. But also we found another value that this helps with is an identity management assistance. It is a significant load on the hospitals to resolve all these identities as they come through the system and requires sometimes teams of individuals who are doing just identity management at the hospital level. But buying it, by being able to pull this information across the community and work together with the community to resolve identities, then as that patient goes from hospital to hospital or clinic to clinic, that identity is automatically resolved, which is a huge load off for them. And we're involved in a, a project with many of the different systems in the state and many of the different clinics and the Department of Health to develop a statewide uh, master patient index that allows these identities to be resolved by the community instead of every different system doing it themselves or every different hospital doing it themselves. Another value add that we find is for public health. It allows public health to come to us with ideas on different things that they would like to see of what's going on with the community, including chronic disease monitoring, and to begin to do epidemiology and to look at this clinical data. And this will only expand as we begin to connect with that claims data to get a complete picture of what's going on with a patient and with patient, po patient populations. Excuse me, that's a mouthful. Uh, and so one of the ways that we've begun to reach work with them is in doing disaster preparation. So we felt like it would be a great resource if there's a major disaster within the state for the physicians that are on site or those nurses or caregivers on site where the disaster is to be able to have access to these patients' medical records and see what medications they're taking, what allergies they may have, or what chronic diseases they're dealing with, so they know how to give the proper care to these patients. And as we've begun to look forward and think, thinking, how can we be more proactive? We're currently working on a project where we are going to develop just some basic numbers around different disease states and counts within the small areas within the state or even down to the zip code level. So that if a disaster happens in the area, we can quickly say, it looks like you've got a significant number of diabetic and asthmatic patients. Um, the pharmacies in the area will probably going to need to have this in, these increased meds to deal with those all those pa all those individuals who have either lost their medications or who this stress is going to push them into a place where they don't want to be. And so by being proactive like that, we can get the medications and the right amount of medications to the location um, before people are injured by not having access to that care. And one way that we've also worked with the state is by having these connections and this infrastructure pre-built so that public health does not need to go out and either require that hospital systems and clinics build connections and that they bear the cost or that public health has to bear their cost themselves to build these connections to have access to this data. This infrastructure is already in place and so it tr provides true savings for the community as a whole. And some of the others that are seeing value from the system, as I mentioned before, are long-term care and home health and behavioral health. <coughs> Excuse me. So long-term care and um, home health, we're really starting to see that with the exchange of advanced directives and the e 
project that we're working on and sharing of those POLT documents between those facilities. Behavioral health, we've seen a real value is they've subscribed to our ADT notifications. Uh, so that as they receive a notification that someone has just popped into the emergency department, they can send a case manager down to help that individual, that patient through the process or to have a conversation with them and probably schedule or possibly schedule an appointment with them to come and see their uh, mental health or behavioral health provider and, and prevent a possible admission to the hospital when it was unnecessary. Uh, EMS we've seen great results with as we've connected and begin to share data with them. Not only is it beneficial for them to share uh, pickup information and that initial contact information, pre-hospital information with the doctors in the hospital, but also to be able to share that care plan and that care information from their hospital visit back to EMS so they can see exactly what's been done and how what they gave at the point of care, the initial pickup, and how has that affected the, the entire care of that patient through the hospital process and through discharge. We've found that that's improved quality of care for the patient. It's improved communication between the hospital and EMS. But one really interesting side effect that we've found from this is that those EMS providers, as they've now been able to go and see those notes of the patients they gave care to, it's been a huge morale booster for them. Previously, they dropped the patient off and that was the last they saw. And they'd go back and they'd try to get information possibly later on in the day to make sure that things were done correctly and they, were, they did the right thing and the patient was okay. And sometimes they, that information was just lost to them. Well, now they can sit down with the, the uh, quality managers at the EMS and they can see, okay, this is what I'm doing and this is the long-term effect it's having on that patient and they can see that they're doing the right thing. It's been a huge morale booster for them. And then as we've connected poison control and be able to exchange that information back forth, we've seen that as a benefit for uh, the nurses in the emergency department who are trying to uh, oversee that communication between poison control, but it's also helped poison control see how the advice and the procedures that they're doing, how is that affecting the long-term care of that patient. So now to move on to population health. Some of the obstacles that we see with doing population health analyses is to be able to get a complete set of data around that patient. Many times a patient you can get you know, 60, 70 percent of the data from a single system, but if you want a complete picture of that population and all of the all of the health data around that patient, then you need to reach out to multiple systems and pull that together. Another obstacle is getting clean data, data that agrees with itself, and to get normalized data um, so that you can see where those specific gaps are, fill those gaps, and then you don't have to uh, begin to do all this processing on the data just to get it to the point where you can analyze it. Another obstacle is many times with doctors, as they put information into the system, that, that information has just been transcribed either via microphone or just typed into a single block of text. And so that data is completely unstructured and it's difficult to do analyses on. And then as you're reaching out and trying to pull all this data together, sometimes you can pull duplicate data together. Uh, sometimes you can get a, the, a doctor We'll put in a single note, he'll put in the multiple days previous to that. So we have that duplicate data there. Many times the resident will sign a note, the attending will sign a note, and the med student will sign a note. And that, many of that information is dupl duplicative within the hospital. And so those are some of the issues that you f uh, fall into as you're trying to bring this information together from a population and do some of the analyses on that data. So to deal with some of those obstacles, uh, we've worked hard to develop tools to overcome some of those obstacles. So as I mentioned before, that comprehensive view of the patient population. How can we pull information together from all these different data sources and make it usable? And then make it clean and make it so that it's normalized across the different data sources. So when, I, when you're looking for a CBC, you're getting all the CBCs and you don't have to go in and put 20 different names for that test. Um, and then to be able to get a complete picture from both clinical and claims and tie that together. So you get all the data that you could need to begin to do some of these analyses and begin to not only look at quality and up real-time quality, but begin to look at cost of that quality of the data. And then, as I mentioned previously, we use that natural language processing tool to begin to structure some of this data that's typically in the past been unstructured. And then to put this, all this data in tools that are actionable 
so that you don't need an analyst to go in and begin to pull all this apart, but you can give this to a case manager who can begin to reach out and call those patients as soon as they sit down at their desk. One of the ways that we've really seen this, and as far as the completeness of data, is in risk assessment. So to be able to get a comprehensive view of patient history, to be able to bring claims and clinical information together, to begin to structure unstructured data so you have all the complete data sets that you'd like to use, and then put it in a way that's actionable and you can begin to reach out and to use this information. So some of the specific use cases, like I said, is uh, risk assessment. And uh, we've begun to compare and co those claims and that clinical data together and to see where those gaps are and how to work to fill those gaps so that you can see exactly what's going on with those patients. Uh, we've begun to do dashboards around syndromic surveillance and capture that information as it comes in and then to begin to make it so it's easily viewable. And then to do readmission reports and to begin to do analyses of how can we begin to predict which patients may be readmitted and then prioritize seeing those patients. And then, of course, dealing with chronic disease populations like diabetes or asthma or some of these other areas where the patient truly needs help in getting on top of the, their own care and how can we reach out and help them? Are there other life stressors that may be affecting that? So apparently this is Jay-Z. I had no idea. Um, you can tell I got help from from Spencer on these. Um, I just thought that that was um, Beyonce, Mr. Beyonce, but apparently that's Jay-Z. Uh, so accurate, complete risk assessment. So what we do is, is we take these uh, messages in from our transcription feeds. Um, we do, a, and to our data warehouse, as was previously mentioned, we also have the ability to send these X12 messages, both 837s, into our system. And then through our 834s, we can create APCD enrollments. And then through our data warehouse, we can com compare the uh, messages from the transcription clinical notes with the X12 messages, the 837s, and then for a specific patient population. And then we can see, okay, which problems are missing from uh, the problem list for these patients that is based just off of solely off of claims and then create a specific file format that can either be used for the risk adjustment profiling system for Medicare and Medicaid or it can be used for marketplace reimbursement for those payers who are on the marketplace. We've also seen that it really helps both the um, the payer and the provider who are beginning to form an ACO type relationship that they can look they can both be on the same page because they're both looking at all the information from the claims and all the information from the clinical and see the true risk profile of their patient populations. Without that understanding, then it's easy for um, the, the payer to say that the certain risk level of the patient, of the patient population is X and the clinicians are saying that it's Y. And as they enter that contract, then the next year as the physician is working with those patients to bring them in and to truly get on top of all of their care, they actually get dinged and get hurt because as they're bringing these patients in, they're actually documenting all of the, all of the illnesses that the patient was already seen for, but for some reason that information was not in the claims. And so that first year, it looks like their patient population is getting in sicker and sicker when actuality all that's happening is that they're getting better and better documentation. So at the get-go, it allows the provider to go in and say, no, this truly is how sick my patient population is. So that first year, as they work hard to improve that care, they're actually seeing improved quality, which makes their numbers better, instead of improved documentation, which can make their numbers worse. So this is an example of how we're pulling ICD-10 codes from a clinical note. I believe that's an ICD-9 code because uh, it's an older note, but in essence, in the assessment and plan section of the note, the doctor will put what the problem is and then what the plan is to remedy that. And many of the EHR systems now automatically insert that ICD-9 or ICD-10 code, which we can then go in and we can capture that. 
And then what we do is from that, those uh, assessment and plan sections of the notes, we can get that entire list, and then we can look at the claims and say, wow, the claim there was only five of those diagnoses when the patient was actually seen for 10 different problems that day. And then we can do a conversion from those that are those uh, problem lists that are in the clinical note, and then we can do a supplemental claim or just send it directly into whatever file format is preferred so you get a complete set of all the diagnoses for which the patient was seen that day. We also have the ability to go back and to say, okay, for the physician, let's look at all of the different problems that the patient was seen for during the year from the assessment and plan section was actually sent over as a claim. And now let's look at all of the different um, problem lists from the historical sense of what the patient had last year, but the patient wasn't necessarily, and was actually seen for this year, but was not specifically uh, documented in the assessment and plan section of the note. We can provide that list to the physician and say, you should probably bring the patient in, have a, have a conversation with that patient around those, those problems that haven't specifically been documented to make sure that you are not going to be deemed just because of it wasn't appropriately documented. So now we'll jump into some of the dashboards that we've built around uh, some of these different chronic, uh, chronically ill patient populations, some of the NQF measures around those, and then hospital admissions and readmissions. So I apologize, I'm trying to get these moved over to the right screen. Did that work? There's the thumb up. That's what I was looking for. All right, so this is um, uh, one of the projects that we've done for the syndromic surveillance around obesity and blood pressure and BMI. And so here you can see that these are different age groups of patients and then they're different BMI levels. So you can see that for those patients that had, oh, actually I misspoke, this is actually around those patients who are hypertensive. And you can see that it's broken down by the different age groups and you can see that the different size of the pie will shows you the different age group and then the count of those patients with that fall within that group. And you can see has how that translates to the different charts as you click through this information. And so you can see that each of these dashboards is interactive. And so I can track the different facilities of where those patients are seen. And then you can see that as they trend through those different facilities, what those different average BMIs are and those different counts of those patients. Here's one where we have blood pressure, systolic and diastolic for the different data, uh, data centers and then the number of patients who are hypertensive. And once again, you can focus in on those different groups and those numbers change. And then that's the same for those patients who with the different BMI levels here. And one caveat on all these numbers is these numbers are, we've, we've made them up. This isn't coming from real data, so I don't everyone to freak out. Um, we've just brought the data in, mixed it up, and then created these dashboards from that mixed up data. Uh, and so you can see, once again, we have this chart, the ability to interact based, based off of age. But on this one, we've added a different geo mapping, and then some of the charts that we see around those different age groups, along with the different BMI ranges. So you can see specific patient populations and zero in on those patient populations. And then we've added a group here based off of those different patient populations. We can do different counts of the reasons why they were admitted into the hospital or why they were seen at the different doctor's offices typical reasons, and then the different counts of those patients. And that also changes as we do the different age ranges. And then this is a breakdown of the different patients at the zip code level. And then um, they're different, uh, it looks like, I wanna say that's the average systolic blood pressure for that patient population. And that would be the size of the circle shows the number of patients with hypertension in that area, or actually with uh, obesity in that area. And then the color is their average uh, systolic blood pressure. 
This is an interesting one which we've done just to show that we have the ability to communicate to external databases and to bring that information in and combine it with clinical information. So we reached out to the census data, pulled in um, the different uh, incomes for different zip codes, and then combined that with hypertension information. So you can zero in on a specific zip code, and as you do, you can see the median income for that zip code, the number of patients that are there, and the estimated population, and the number of obese patients in the area. And the ability to drill in, drill out, and you can see that that's why we have more people in our MPI than we do in the state of Utah, because of the neighboring states that are visiting, and beyond. All right, so this is a, a group of patients. Uh, we picked on Revere Health on this one, but once again, this, this data has been completely uh, um, randomized. And these are just some admissions for our uh, ADTs. So you can see that we have a count of emergency visits and also inpatient visits, and then the different reasons why those patients were uh, seen and why they were admitted. And each one of these blocks, the size and the color represents the number that we're seeing. And then you can see that here it creates an actual working list. So let's say I was someone working at Revere. I could go in and say which of our patients were seen at HCA. I can click on that. It changes the different reasons why they were seen, Changes shows me which were emergency, which were inpatient, and gives me a working list of the patients so that I know who to reach out to and uh, who I can call. And this chart in, in reality actually has that patient information, first name, last name, um, insurance, and then has all their contact information. So a case manager knows exactly who they're working with and how to best reach, in, reach out to work with them. And this is another version of, a very, of the same sort of data, but this one is a little bit more technical in that it shows the different types of messages that were seen, the admission, discharge, or whether they were just registered. And then it has the count broken down by day. So if I want to look at just the last few days, I can select those, and then I can see the different facilities they went to, and then I can see who I need to reach out to for those patients to call them. And I can even see their diagnoses on this one. So it's just a tool that is actionable that a case manager or a clinic manager has access to this information. They can go in and quickly create their own filters on the fly. It's cloud-based, and they can begin to create lists of patients that they can reach out to and work with to get them in and get them seen. And this is one that we've done specifically for the hospitals. Let me get that to do that again. There we go where we're looking at readmissions rates. So these are patients that were seen, and then within 60 days, maybe a little bit higher, yeah, just uh, maybe 90 days, they were admitted to the hospital again. And so it gives a, uh, a lookup of those patients, uh, and then the different, different locations they were admitted to, or readmitted to, excuse me, within the hospital, and then shows whether it was emergency, inpatient, or whether it was an observation stay. Um, and then um, you can see each of these blocks represents an individual patient. And so you can see, well, this guy was back multiple times. I can click on that group. I can see the different days. I can see where and the different reasons why. And then that also that would include contact information so your case managers and quality managers can reach out to those patients and begin to problem solve why these admissions are happening. What's nice about this chart is it allows those at the hospital to say, okay, uh, the height of the chart here shows the number of readmissions that were done at that specific area within the hospital, but the red line here shows the date, the long, the length of time between readmissions for those different uh, areas within the hospital. And so if you have a high number here and then a low number on the line, you know that's an area you can really go and work with and how can we solve this problem? How can we work with these patients? Obviously, the emergency department is the outlier because that's typically the gateway into the system, um, but you can see that the, the concept is there. All right, so this is one where we've done specifically around uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, and 
the different patient populations broken down by the different facilities, broken down by the counts of those patients, and then what the average hemoglobin A1Cs are for the different data sources. Uh, and then this house, the, the size of this and the color of this is, shows just uh, what that average is for those different areas. Uh, so you can see that you have a, uh, a normal, a pre-diabetic, uh, out of control and a way out of control different levels for those patients with their hemoglobin A1Cs. And you can see that's lined up here, maybe here exactly the same. What's nice though about this is this shows the number of days since their last hemoglobin A1C and then also the last, what their last hemoglobin A1C level was. So you can see, okay, it's been 80 days, 90 days since their last hemoglobin A1C. But I want to get these outliers that half the last one they got was really bad. And also it's been a long time since we told them it was really bad. They could be in real trouble. So I can select that group of patients. And then what that does is that gives me the list of patients that I can reach out to and add them to my list to begin working to getting that contact and getting them in. Uh, that's truly makes that's what truly makes this dashboard actionable and useful to begin to identify those patients and then begin to get them in and, and get help them get on top of whatever may be causing these issues around their health. And one more for good measure. This, once again, is just to show the geoanalysis tool. Once again, we've gone down to the zip code level, and the size of the circle shows how many patients, and then the dot in the middle shows the severity. And we have our patient list here, and once again, our ability to highlight those patients. So here we have the days since they've last had their systolic blood pressure measured, and we have their systolic pressure, blood pressure as it being out of control. So we can say, wow, these patients could be in real trouble and could be facing a significant cardiac issue. I can select those patients and now have my patient list and reach out and begin to work with them and get them in to, the, in to see their physician, get on top of their medications, or at least just check their blood pressure and find out what's going on. And then look at the different um, levels of those of those blood pressures, and what are the different where are the different locations that they're seen, and what are causing some of those outliers. And then are the are there hypertensive, prehypertensive patients? What are the counts? How is that trending over time? How is age or another patient demographic affecting those blood pressures? And once again, what's my patient list that I can reach out to and begin to contact those patients and work with them? All right, I think that's the end. All right. Um, are there any, let me go through here and properly adjust this. There we go. Any questions? As a reminder, you can submit questions by going to the chat box in the upper right corner. We'll see those and read them out for Matt to answer. Yeah, I think we'll give it 30 seconds. A question came in. Um, Matt, have you had any issues with data blocking due to the competitive nature of healthcare in our state? Um, I would say we've had zero from the competitive nature of healthcare. Did you see that dripping with sarcasm? Um, but I don't think anyone has ever said it's because of the competitive nature of it's always been around. Um, security or privacy or consent or technology or um, whatever issues. There, there's always, there are always reasons for not sharing. And so 
this is one of the reasons we've worked so hard to come up with the ability to exchange data in any way anybody is willing to share information. And many of times, uh, I don't mean to to mock or to oversimplify some of the, some of those concerns because they are very real concerns. Um, it, they are still, nonetheless, um, I think concerns that can be overcome. Sometimes just the solution is more difficult than just plugging and sending data. Uh, and so we've tried to develop a tool set here at UHIN that allows us to address all of those concerns as quickly as possible and to begin to build those, those connections and to begin to share that data. That's why uh, there are some data sources who push data. There are some data, data sources who require a query to use that data. But we feel like if we can find the right solution for all the data sources that addresses their concerns, then most data sources are, see the value and realize that it is good for the patient and that and then are then willing to share that information. Uh, it's just finding, I think, the right tool for the right use case to get that information exchanged and get that information shared. And I think that that's a real change that we've seen just in the last few years. Uh, I think we went from a lot of entities not willing to share data that morphed and changed into a lot of entities just wanting to exchange information. Um, and now we see a real push for true interoperability, where this data can be used for population health management. It can be used for quality analytics. It can be used for predictive modeling instead of just the exchange of information at the point of care for that patient. Uh, I think nationally this is happening and everyone is moving forward and more and more embracing the use of data for those other reasons instead of just that specific use case of the care for that patient at the bedside. There was an additional question about the availability of this presentation. Uh, the recording will be made available to everybody. We'll send it out in an email to all the registered participants, and it will be available on the UHIN website. It may take us a few hours up to a day or two just for the video to compile and for us to get it all sent out, but you'll be receiving a copy shortly. And I think that goes true. If you'd like to see some of these demos or begin to, to mess around with some of these dashboards, please just reach out to one of our, our reps, uh, shoot us an email, and we're happy to come out and, and show you some of the tools that are available, walk you through their use, uh, do anything we can just to, uh, to get the tools in the hands of the community to begin to get at the underpinnings of, of the healthcare for the state. Are there any other questions? Should we set people free? Okay. Thank you everybody for attending. Really appreciate your time and your, I hope your attentiveness. Um, I really appreciate your support for you, Hen, and your interest in all that we're trying to do to move healthcare forward and to improve the quality of the patients that we all care about so much. Thank you.